Hey, what's up? This is Paul Solt from Super Easy Apps, and I want to give you a demonstration of test-driven development. This was a talk that I gave for Lambda School, and I just want to jump in and, and show you what we're doing. So we've got this application, we've got this trial period dialogue that we want to test out the code. Nothing's been written yet, so our first starting point is to just get started with unit tests in general. And we've got this project here. We've got a, a sample test that will run, but I want to talk about one thing real quick, and that is making fast unit tests. So whenever I'm unit testing, I want them to be as quick as possible. And when they're slow, you don't want to run them, and it's annoying. So what I've set up is under the project properties in this sample project, I've already set this up. This is going to behave a little bit different. But what I'm using are what are called logic tests. So if we click on the test target, if you can find that, sometimes you can't see it, you have to click this little button. You can click on the test target and then go to general right in the center tab. You'll see that there's a host application. This is by default set up to just run the stuff and allows you to run all the code. It's initially set up like this. You can hit the run button. It will go ahead and if I actually launch the test, so that's running the actual app, let's do the test. To do that, you can long press on this and you can click on test and that will switch it over to test or you can do the product and then there's this test menu option and that will run the test. So if we go ahead and test that, what you're going to see is it's going to boot up and then it's going to run your test. The whole application starts up and then it finishes. So that takes a little bit of time to actually start up your app. And if your app's more complicated, then you're gonna be waiting for all of that stuff to load. So you might want to, to trim down your launch sequence or a quick way around that is if you just need to test some of the logic, you can disable this. So if you set this to none, then it will launch your unit test faster. So if we go ahead and try to run our tests, they will actually execute really fast, usually within two seconds on my machine. The other one takes about seven to eight seconds to boot the app, and your mileage may vary depending on the complexity of your application. All right, so that's what I've got going. That's gonna allow this for quick, fast tests. Now, the other thing that I've provided in here is we've got the time traveler class. We'll get to this when we get to it, but this is something that I've already pre-written. You can practice writing this out so that you sort of understand how it works. This is a really good thing. This comes from John Sundell's blog post, and we'll be using that in our tests. The other thing that you'll see here is our trial period test file. This is where we'll be writing all of our code. Now, typically, if you're not doing logic tests like we've set up, you would want to import your module. But since we're going to be doing logic tests, we're actually going to import our code directly to our test target, and I'll show you how to do that when we get to that point and that will make our code run faster, but it's gonna be a little bit different. Typically, you would have a line like this, and if you had spaces in your name, you would have underscores replacing those spaces. We're not gonna worry about that. We're gonna focus on our tests. So right now, this is passing. If I were to change our expected to say 59, and we were to run our unit test again, I'm using the keyboard shortcut, Command U, we see that the test has failed, and this is sort of our red-green refactor loop. So we're gonna have a failing test. We're going to fix it. However, we're gonna do that. We're going to run our tests again. And what we're looking for is this red arrow should become green and we should have test success. So that's where we're starting. And let's jump in. So the first thing that I like to do here is I want to make sure that I'm doing this as fast as possible. And so that sometimes means doing everything in one file to begin. We'll refactor stuff later. So we'll pull out the class as we get going. So let's just get rid of this and we'll begin with our very first functional test in this project. Now, as we go, I, I'm going to try and create some snapshots as starting points if you want to follow along so that you can look at my revision history on GitHub and sort of follow along. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. The final version will be posted on GitHub and I'll have links to that exact version so that you can get the final project as well as the starter project. All right, so every test always begins with a test word. 
And so what we'll write in this test class, so we've got our, our test case class. So this is a, a new test file that we've created and we can get started writing our unit test code inside of it. So we'll create a new function called test and we'll just call this trial period to get started. And all we wanna do is verify that we can create a trial. And so we'll go in and we'll create a trial. So what we'll see here is if we try to run our test with command U, that it's going to fail. And this is telling us that it doesn't know what that is. So in order to get this to pass, we're going to go through that red, green refactor loop. So this is a red. Now we're going to try and get this to pass. We get that to pass by creating a class called trial period. We run our test again and we get to the next step. So we pass here, but that doesn't really do anything other than create the object. So now let's go ahead and think about how we can arrange some things. We can act on something and then we can assert a condition. So we're gonna go through this process as we write the tests to sort of understand, okay, what can we test? Well, going back to the design, if I jump back over to that in PowerPoint or Keynote, you can see we want to test date installed. So that's going to be the first thing they're going to work. And I'm going to work my way through these. And having a list either on paper or next to you can really help you as you're going through these steps. So the first thing we want to focus on is date installed. So let's go ahead and create a trial. We'll create an expected date. And then we'll create the actual date. We're trying to invoke that property. It's called date installed. It doesn't exist yet. So now we've got uh, a compilation failure. So now we've got red. So in order to fix that, we go ahead and we add the variable to our class. So we're gonna create date installed. That's gonna be a date type. We'll try and run again. If you've never written a class before, um, you're gonna go through a couple cycles here where you need to get this to pass. So we need an initializer. And for this, we can just use the default initializer and we can just say date installed and I'll do self.date installed is equal to, and in this case, I'll just assign that to a date. So now if we go ahead, we run we now have build success. The test is passing, but it's really not passing because we're not actually asserting anything yet. So let's go ahead and now write our assert statement. All of this work we're doing is just to write our, our first test, but it's helping us think, how would the user use this code? How would we actually use this in the application? So there are a series of methods that we can use in the test framework that Apple provides. And they all start with this X, C, and then T. So we can assert true, we can assert false, we can assert equal. Uh, if we wanted to, we could also fail it so that it always fails. And I'm going to do assert equal. We're going to write our expected. We always try to do the expected first, and then whatever the actual result. This just keeps it easy to see. And... There we go. Go ahead and run this. And it should, s no, it doesn't succeed. Okay, so now we have a problem. Why doesn't this work? Well, let's dig into it a little bit. Let's print out those dates. And so we can do some print statements. Let me just go in here and print out our expected. And I'm going to print out the time interval since a, a reference date. So this is from 2001, January 1st. And I'll compare that to actual. And you get more code completion if you write it the way I did the first time. So hopefully I've written that correctly. 
Um, so it's a lot easier if you complete your quotation marks. And let's run this test again and see what's happening. So now we're going to look at our test output and we'll see that we've got two different time values. Now, they look very similar, but we can see that the ending is just a little bit different. They differ in nanoseconds. And so what we're running into is that time is very precise when we're on a, a development platform or when we're on technology. Like it's, it's very, very precise. It's not like how we experience it. There's a second that goes by or there's a minute that goes by. Like time is, is very specific. And so what we saw in this is that it was failing and they look the same. And so this is where you have to sort of be creative in how you want to test anything relating to time. Sometimes you want to test around a certain window. So you want to say, is this within 60 seconds of occurring? Um, rather than, is this the exact nanosecond when this happens? And so this is going to, to make it a challenge to write your very first test with regard to time because we need to be able to compare to the same time. And as you can see, even though these differ only in a few lines of code, the first date is created here, and uh, the other date is actually created in our initializer. So they're, they're separated by two lines of code in our test method, and they have different time values because it actually takes time to execute them on your microprocessor. All right, so how can we fix this? Well, this is where we want to use the time traveler. And in order to get started with that, we need to add some extra code. And the time traveler is going to allow us to fast forward in time. And the way this is going to work is that we'll be able to create this time traveler object, which has a date that it stores. And then we'll be able to change that date by traveling forward in time. That'll allow us to write our tests in the beginning. But the, the most important part that we need right now is the ability to create new dates that we can control, to create times that we can control to verify that the logic is actually happening. And so what we're going to leverage is a basically passing a, a method that can create dates. And so this is a method. It takes no parameters, and it returns a date. So its type is of empty parameters return type of date. We can actually pass this into our, our testing logic as something that allows us now to, to verify that this is going to happen. So let's go ahead and do that. We are going to want to take some kind of parameter into our initializer. So to get started, what I'm going to do to make this look a little bit nicer is a type alias. And we're going to call this date generator. You might want to call this clock. It's really up to you what you call this. But this will be the same method signature. So you're going to see I'm going to write the same thing that we saw in the method for date generator. And that's just going to allow us to refer to this so it's a little bit easier to read in our code down here. Now we're going to store this so we can actually store a function. So I'm going to write var date generator. And this is going to be of type date generator. So we've just created this name for this function that we can store. And now we want to pass that into our initializer. So in order to do that, we're going to pass in the date generator. And this is going to be of type date generator. So that's going to be our date generator type. And we'll try and build that. So now we're failing down here. So we're in our red green refactor stage. So right now we're in the try to make it pass still. So we're still in the red. We're trying to make this pass. So we're going to pass in our date generator. And now we have to actually create a time traveler so that we can pass this in. So it's expecting this, this type. So what we'll do is we'll create time traveler. This allows us to go forward in time, just like in Back to the Future. And we'll go ahead and create that. Now this takes a date object. So I'm going to pass in our expected date. And then I'm going to have to move that line of code up. So let's grab this, cut it, paste it right here. Now what we need to do is we need to pass that function that the time traveler has, and it's called the generate date. Now when I do this 
Xcode will autocomplete those parentheses. That will actually execute and give us a date, but we don't want to execute the function. We actually just want to pass the function. So to do that, we get rid of those two parentheses. And now we're passing a function to our trial period. All right, but we haven't initialized everything. So let's jump back up. We'll say self.date generator is equal to our date generator that was passed in. And now we're going to see another error. So this is whenever we're passing a function that goes beyond the scope of another function and we want to store it long term, we need to add an extra attribute. So Xcode will offer this fix it. We just need to put escaping up top. And if we just click on fix, that'll insert that logic for us. So anytime you're passing a function that needs to be used outside of the method that it's being passed into, and in this case, we're storing a variable reference to it, that's where you need to have escaping here. Okay, so now that is set up. And if we go ahead and run our unit test, we can see, does this help? And it still fails. And, and, and now if we look, it's because we're still calling date directly. Now this, this is what the, the method that we're doing right now with the time traveler is designed to help with. So instead of calling date directly, we'll now indirectly call whatever is going to be keeping track of our date with our date generator function. So we can just call our date generator. And if we add the parentheses to it, this will actually invoke the function right here so that we can use our date generator to generate a date installed, and that will be our expected date. So if we go ahead and if we run this, what we're gonna see as we step over is we're gonna create our expected date. I'm gonna step into our time traveler. We're gonna store the date in our time traveler object and step over. And now we're going to create our trial period. If I step into that, you see that the date installed is being set to our date generator. And if I had the variable view, we can see that we have a, a date installed that has been set up. We step over that. We see that it gets initialized with a new time and we can step over that. And now we can see our, our expected time down here. And, and this looks like the same value to me. You could compare back to what we had. And can we see that? So we can see that these are matching. And if I let this finish, we see that the test succeeds. All right, so that's kind of how the plumbing works. Set a breakpoint just by clicking here and you can follow along. All right, so all of this logic was to get our first test to pass. I know it's a lot. I want you to, to take a break. I want you to look at what we have here, play with it on your own, set the breakpoint, and when you're done, you can get rid of the breakpoint, just delete it, and that's our first test. So I'm just gonna clean this up, and we'll end this video lesson here. We'll pick back up with the next test where we can actually start diving into more of the API for this trial period. All right, I'll catch you in the next video.